Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, my name is Dean Anderson from the St. Albert Church of Christ. Uh, I'm going to tell you an interesting fact that happened today, May 19th. In 1911, Parks Canada was the world's first National Park Service, and that's the day it was founded. So kind of interesting. I had no idea. Kind of interesting to read that. We have a little bit of time. Uh, we're having a a discussion Bible study so people can discuss in the comments. So so while I wait for people to join in, I'm going to read a few jokes. My wife claims I'm the cheapest person she's ever met. I'm not buying it. I grilled the chicken for two hours. It still wouldn't tell me why I crossed the road. Give me I can get in here. If you haven't noticed, it might look a little different. I got a new phone. I mean, mine kind of broke on me, so I had to get a different one. So my camera probably looks a little bit different. To the person who stole my chairs and bed, I will not rest until I find you. Oh, there's Joyce. Hi, Joyce. If you're here, say hello so other people know that you're here as well. Don't you hate it when someone answers their own questions? I do. Maybe one or two more, possibly. I think we got a good enough people amount on here, the usual amount. Why was the baby jalapeno shivering? He was a little chilly. All right. Okay, this will be the last one, I think. I think this will be enough time for everybody to join in. Did you hear about the burglar who fell into a concrete mixer? It's actually a cement mixer. He's now a hardened criminal. All right, that's enough jokes for today. I still think it's weird me saying jokes and there's being total utter silence in the room. But people always tell me every week, yeah, they're laughing, everything, everybody thinks it's funny. So we're talking about money today. Uh, this is the first time I actually thought of the whole title of these lessons that I'm doing called the Word of the Week, because that's essentially what it is. Uh, we're looking at different words in the Bible. Uh, it's been going on for actually quite a while. We started at A. Uh, I can't even remember the words that we did with A, but... It's going through every week. Uh, we do a different word going down through the alphabet. And this week is money. We're on M. Uh, we actually skipped M because the book that I was using as a guide uh, jumped. It skipped the letter M. Went from L to N. And it kind of missed the M in there. So I thought, well, some people pointed it out. I didn't notice at first. And I uh, thought, oh, yeah, interesting. That's true. So, you know, put some M words in there. So money was one of the ones that I came to my mind. Uh, because it is interesting that the Bible has a lot of really good information about money. Uh, there's a Len. Hello, Len. Um, again, the way the, work, the study works, uh, I'm going to ask questions. Uh, anytime you feel like making a comment, please comment in the section below. Uh, I'm paying attention for when it pops up and it scrolls up on my display on my phone here. So I'll read the comment out and uh, comment on it. Uh, there's going to be two specific questions I'm going to ask as the study goes along. And then, again, with those, I'm going to hope we get some responses, and I'll read those responses off as the study goes. So who wishes they could make money appear out of nowhere? Good thing is, is I found a special pack of Star Wars trivia cards where this actually happens. You know, they're a card. It's got a little question and answer in the back. I discovered this the other day when I was taking these things out. You, know, you got the card, you know, with trivia on it. But with these cards, it's kind of interesting you know, I was, I was looking at it one time, and all of a sudden, the money appeared out of nowhere. Got some cash there. So who wishes that would happen in real life, where you could actually have real money just appear out of nowhere? You know, you have a magic pack of Star Wars cards like I do, and you can make money magically, and make it just suddenly appear. You know, would that be the solution to all of your problems? Would all of a sudden all of your problems in the world go away? Because now, all of a sudden, you have money, because you have magic Star Wars cards. Oh, the Clarks are here. Hello, Clarks. So I am going to start with the first question of the evening. People ask nicely. I might show you how I did that trick. So the first question of the evening. Um, I asked my wife this earlier, and, and she was a little bit confused. So hopefully hopefully people have a, a, an answer to this. Uh, again, even if you're not answering the question 100%, I don't mind. As long as you put a comment in and have a response, I'll be very, very happy with that. The question is, what is the first feeling that comes to your mind when you hear the word money? Or when you think about money. When you think about money, what do you feel right off the bat? Some of the things when I was kind of brainstorming to myself. Is it excitement? You know, you're happy. Oh, I get to spend money on something. 
Uh, is it confusion? You don't know what to do with your money. Uh, is it uncertainty? You don't know where your money's going to come next. You know, maybe you don't know how to spend your money because you have so much of it, you go to spend it on stuff. Maybe it's frustration. Maybe it's a cause of, of pain in your life because maybe you're fighting with your, I don't know, I've heard that, that married couples, that's one of the most common things they fight about is money. You know, how to spend the money, how to save the money, who gets money to spend on fun stuff and who doesn't. Hopefully that's an equal thing, but you know, it's one of those things that is a, is a source of uh, frustration to a lot of people. Oh, Tina says security. Uh, that was actually, that's mine too. I feel the same way as Tina. And some people might feel fear. Again, fear about where that money is going to come. Uh, Gail says made it. You know, how do you, you know, you made it. I think that's what she's trying to say. You know, I've made it. I got the money. Uh, maybe it's apprehension to figure out what to do with it. Uh, Joy says she thinks about how she can use it. So more of an analytical thing, uh, contemplating the way that you can spend your money and what you should do with your money. Uh, maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's some kind of negative feelings that you have. Again, maybe you're, uh, it's a cause of some sort of uh, problem with a relationship that you might have. Maybe it caused an argument with maybe a close friend or maybe your spouse in the past. So you feel kind of a bitter feeling when you start thinking about money. Uh, that money, it's always a cause of problems. Uh, maybe it's indifference. Maybe you're just not emotionally attached to money. Uh, to me, I think that's a blessing that you should feel grateful for in a lot of ways because it is a source of problems for a lot of people in the world. But maybe you're just thinking, well, it's just a tool of society. It's just something I got to deal with and something I got to work through, uh, something I got to determine how to deal with it in a very logical, step-by-step -step manner, and you feel a little bit of indifference, not much feeling at all. Uh, Melinda thinks of the song, Money, Money, Money. So she feels blessed that she can have a job where she can make money. So again, uh, a grateful feeling. Maybe you feel thankful. Maybe that's the feeling that you have. Oh, Brenda Ball's here. Hello. Uh, Helen says security as well. Uh, maybe looking for ways to help people. That's what she's saying. And again, for me, that's the first thing that popped in my head. When I think money, I think security. If I have enough money that I can provide for myself, provide for my family, I feel good, I feel secure. If that money's not there, so I can't quite meet the bills, because I've had that happen in my life in the past. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I was terrible with money. And so I was always, you know, kind of trying to scrape and figure out the best way to make my payments, you know, at the end of the week and the end of the month, you know, trying to make ends meet in that way. I ate a lot of pasta and craft dinner during that period of my life. It's one of those things. If, if you have the money, you can feel safe and secure. And that's what I can relate to. That's what I me mean, personally, the feeling that I have. Uh, it makes me wonder, our feelings toward money might actually hinge on whether we have it or we don't have it. Uh, your feeling might be different if you have money in the bank and you are secure. Maybe you feel a little bit differently if you don't have money in the bank and you're wondering how to make ends meet. Your feeling toward money might be uh, different if you're in those two different situations. Maybe it's the way you handle it. Maybe the way you approach money and finances and wealth and those sorts of things. Uh, the way that you look at the situation overall, uh, the importance that it plays in your life, that's going to affect how you feel about money and how you approach how to handle money. I always find it interesting, uh, the people that say, uh, just be content with what you have. Uh, I think a lot of the time I've heard it said that the people that say that are the ones that actually have money. You know, just be content. And they're saying that because they have money so they can be content. And I think that's true to a lot of, to, to a certain point. Um, I do think there's a lot of people that don't have money that have learned how to be content in that situation. Uh, but it is kind of funny sometimes. If you have the money, maybe your feelings are a little bit less negative towards money than if you don't have money. It might be a little bit more negative, but I could be totally wrong on that. That's something that is very dependent on the person's outlook on life and how they see things. The Bible, God's Word, does teach us a lot about, well, it teaches us everything about righteousness, uh, how to please God, how to get to heaven, how to have that plan of salvation in our lives. The other thing that it also talks about in there is how to deal with our finances, uh, how those finances and dealing with the physical life that we have, the money, the wealth, how it fits into our righteous life. Uh, he tells us in the scriptures, God tells us in the scriptures, how to deal with our finances, how to deal with our money. And it's very interesting. So what does God tell us about money? Uh, let's look at a few points. Uh, it's one of those things where we can look in the scriptures. Uh, we're going to look at just a few things tonight. It's an area of study that you can spend a lot of time on. You can do a lot of research on 
what the Bible teaches us about money. Uh, in one reference that I found, there's up to 2,300 references to how to use our, uh, you know, how to use our money, our wealth, uh, how to approach finances. That deals with that subject from the Bible. 2,300 ways, uh, 2,300 references in the New Testament or in the Bible on how to deal with our money. So there's a lot of stuff in there on how to deal with that. So we're going to look at a few things. Uh, we're going to start with Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, Brenda Ball says if uh, she ever had a chance to make a lot of money, um, she would go traveling. She'd go see her sister, set up an account, and, you know, help other people, it looks like. She wants to help people that she, she loves, helps her sister, and go see her sister. So it's very good. It's a good way to approach how to use your money. Uh, maybe not for those selfish things, but use things or use your money to help other people. And we're going to see in the scriptures that's one of the things that we should be doing with our finances. Hebrews 13. Now we're going to look at verses 5 and 6. This is a verse that's going to tell us and kind of set out the framework on how we are to view money. How are we to view those finances in our lives? God tells us we should be content. Uh, this is going to come up in a couple of verses that we're going to look at tonight. It's a very important thing that he wants us to understand with respect to money. So Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. It says, Your conduct must be free from the love of money, and you must be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, and I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid. What can people do to me? It's a challenging standard. Our conduct must be free from the love of money, and we must be content with what you have. Uh, the next verse that we're going to look at, or the, another verse that we are going to look at, shows how we should be content with the basic necessities. If we have that, we should be kind of done, and we shouldn't have that craving for money. Uh, I think even if we're lacking in some of those basic necessities, we still shouldn't have a love of money. We should still be putting God as a priority in our life. But it is a very challenging standard. Uh, Especially, uh, you know, I've only lived in this time period, so this is what I'm kind of bombarded with. But, you know, you turn on your computer, you turn on the TV, bombarded with advertisements all the time. You know, you're always doing that. Uh, and social media, we're on social media right now. They track everything that you look at, everything that you click, and they tailor the advertisements to you. They try to uh, anticipate what you're interested in, what you might spend money on, and they spend or they, they make sure that those ads Spend more time in front of your eyes so you have more uh, likelihood to purchase those things. Uh, it's something that we're bombarded with. We're surrounded by money. It's in so many different aspects in our lives. And again, if you don't have money, if you're barely making ends meet, you might think about it all the time and have a love for money in that way. You're just constantly thinking about how you can earn money and it's starting to affect every decision of your life. You constantly think about how you're going to meet your bills, how you're going to make ends meet. And you always want more to try to make those ends meet. On the other side of things, if you do have money, are you still able to be content? You know, or maybe is it easier for you to be content in that situation? Uh, maybe the love of the money isn't a problem then, but it probably is or it can be. Uh, with whatever you have, you typically just end up wanting more. Uh, I've always thought if you're a billionaire, you know, you have a billion dollars in the bank, you can live a very comfortable life. For the rest of your life and not have to work, not have to be concerned about money. You can help a lot of people in the world with that money. Oftentimes, though, the people that have a billion dollars in the bank want a billion more. You know, they still want to earn more money. It's more of a, a desire rather than the actual number in their bank account. Uh, one thing my dad used to say, he says, most of the time, our outgo matches our income. So if you're making a certain amount of money, your outgo matches that amount of money. They give you a raise. You figure out a way to spend a little bit more so it matches up there too. So you're still maybe trying to try to meet those bills because you spend that money on stuff that maybe you don't need so much. You know, whether you have money or don't have money, you can still fall into that trap of having a love for money and you lack contentment in that situation. So regardless of our situation, it is possible to have a love of money. Uh, again, we are bombarded with advertisements. Uh, they're showing us a life that's so appealing that we want to hand our cash to them so we can buy that happiness that we see in these commercials. Oh, if only I had those things. You know, I could make have those things and I could be just as happy as those actors in that commercial. You know, with their kids that they're not related to. You know, they have this happy life and we want to buy that happy life too. You know, money starts to become that idol that we begin to look for so that we can have happiness and contentment. We start looking to money to give us that happiness and that contentment. 
when really, in fact, content in this come from other sources. It comes from serving God, it comes from studying the Bible and serving Him. That's how we can be content. And it doesn't come from money or the number that's in your bank account. So that leads to the second question. How can we be content with respect to our finances? So how can we be content with the money that we either have or we don't have? How can we be content with what we have, what we're blessed with? You know, it, it all starts with a mindset. It all starts with what you're thinking in your head. Uh, we have to make sure that we're thinking about the right things. If you're always thinking about making more money so you can buy more things and all of your decisions are based on how to make more money, you know, I'm going to do this and that because that's going to earn me a little bit more money. And it's not wrong to have a job. It's not wrong to try to earn more money and be successful uh, with respect to finances. But when it starts to impregnate and get into every part of your life, you know, it starts to infiltrate in every decision that you make. You know, it's something that starts to take over your life and it starts to become your master. It starts to become your idol. And you start wanting more and more and more regardless of what you have and you stop being content with what you have. You just continually want more and more and more. We have to start thinking about the right things. Uh, I want to see if it pops up in the comments. There's another really good one that I thought of that I think people are going to be thinking of too. Uh, you know, again, how can we be content with respect to our finances? One of the biggest things is having a really good understanding of what you need versus what you want. So what you need versus what you want. The verse that we looked at, uh, be content with what you have, whatever that might be. You know, be content. Understand that if you have your necessities met, you can be content. It's very easy to be content. Uh, one thing that I've mentioned, I mentioned it in several lessons in the past. Uh, I was in university and they asked me, uh, they had a graph. They had a graph where you have money going up and you have happiness. Or no, sorry, it was uh, money and happiness. You know, how much happiness do you get? So you think that the more money you get, the happier you're going to be. So you have money, money's on the bottom, happiness is going up. That's the way it was. So the more money you get, you get more and more money, how happy are you going to be? And most people draw this straight line. So the more money you get, the happier you're going to be. The more money you get, the happier you're going to be. And the way the line actually went was it went up and then it went flat. Once we meet those basic necessities, no matter how much more money you get, you're not going to get more happy. You're going to stay the same level of happiness as somebody that has their basic necessities met versus the people that have like a billion bucks in the bank. You know, the happiness has, or the amount of money you have has no bearing on your happiness once your basic necessities are met. Um, Brenda was saying it's very troubling uh, to be short of funds almost all your life. So again, very true. Uh, when you don't have a lot of help from your family, you're in a whole lot of different difficult situations. And it's very challenging. It's a very challenging thing to be in that situation. It's very true. Um, so how can life be easier in that way? You know, that's what Brenda's asking. It's very true. It's something where it's very challenging to be content when you don't have those basic necessities met. When you don't have that money to, to make sure that you have, you know, a roof over your head, clothes, food, you know, those basic things. Uh, again, having that understanding of what is a need versus what is a want. And I think that might be a little bit different between different people as well. When I think to myself, um, a bicycle, uh, is a bicycle a need or a want? And I think that depends on your situation. If that's your only source of transportation, then it's probably more of a need. You know, if you need to get from, you know, your home to your office, your work, and you're not driving, you use the bike and it turns to go in more of that need spectrum. I don't think it's 100% need, but it's probably closer to that spectrum. Whereas if somebody has another way to get to work or there's not in that situation, then maybe that's less of a need. So I think it's variable depending on the people, what is a need what is and what is a want. But we have to have a good understanding of what those things are if we want to be content. Uh, if we want to be content with our finances and we understand that we don't really need this one thing that's going to cost a lot of money, we can hold off and not buy it and have money for those things that we actually do need, like food or paying your bills, making sure you have power, make sure you have water, all of those things. We go to Matthew 6. If we want to be content, we have to have our priorities straight. You know, we have to make sure that we understand what is important in our life. Is it making that extra cash or is it something else? Uh, we are not to put any idols or those priorities higher than God. Now, Matthew 6, 24 is what we're going to read. Uh, this verse deals with having two masters. Can we? Is it possible to have those two masters? So Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for he'll, he'll, 
For either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So very interesting verse. Uh, again, it, it depends on what you're putting your uh, all of your, I guess, eggs in that one basket. You're really focusing on who you are going to serve. When we start to let earning and spending money uh, take over all the decisions that we make, it's starting to become our master. If everything that we do is based on whether or not we're going to lose money or make money, and that's always the driving force in all of our decisions, and that happens with certain people, it's going to become our master. So we have to understand who we are truly serving. Is it going to be society or the advertisements that tell you that you need the next greatest thing? Or is it going to be God who can truly lay up those treasures for you in heaven? Who are you going to serve? What is your priority in life? We should only have one master, and that's God. And again, God has given us many good or a lot of good instruction in the Bible as to how to handle our finances. I mentioned earlier, there's over 2,300 references on money, wealth, possessions in the Bible, and what we are to do with those things. So God gives us some good instruction on how to use our money and how that can fit into our lives where we do serve him and he is our master and he is our priority. And we can essentially have, uh, in a sense, both of those things in a way because we are treating God as our master and he's going to help us to have that secure, uh, content life with respect to our finances. We're going to look at one tip. If you go to Proverbs 21, verse 20. Like I was saying, 2,300 references. We're not going to be able to look at all of them, uh, but we are going to look at one which is a really interesting verse that teaches us how to handle that situation when we're tempted with that advertisement that makes life seem so good and we have to do understand what to do with that temptation. Uh, we have to remember to save first and indulge second. So Proverbs 21 and verse 20. I'm going to read a couple of different versions because I like the way the different versions read in, in the situation. So I'm going to read the first from the more, more modern version of the NIV. Uh, so I'm going to start with that one. So Proverbs 21 and verse 20 says, The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Okay, and then I go to the old NIV. I actually typed this out from my, my older Bible here. So they changed the NIV at a certain period of time. I'm not sure the year. So the other NIV, the version it reads, In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil but a foolish man devours all he has. So here we got two sides. We get the wise guy, we get the foolish guy. And God is telling us here that being wise and saving first and making sure that you have that, that food and olive oil. So, you know, in our sense, it'd be money in the bank, saved up and ready to go. That's the wise person rather than gulping it down. So rather than just spending it on anything that you see, you know, understand that God wants us to be safe. He wants us to be secure. He wants us to be content. And he's giving us a good instruction on here and how to do that. Uh, wouldn't that help in that trap of falling into the love of money? You know, if you have the money in the bank, if you put money away for the purpose of spending it on other things, again, those luxuries that you might want, if you plan for those things, you save a little bit every paycheck, you put away for it, you have that, you know, store of choice food and olive oil kind of there, ready to go. So that when you get to that point, when you can afford it, and then you buy that luxury and you can appreciate it, and it's not driving every decision in your life, you're not uh, focusing so much on it that it's a love of money, and you're trying to replace God with that thing. You know, he's showing us how we can treat money in a smart way and still have him as our master, and we don't fall into that trap of a love of money. You know, it's one of those things that's going to lower our stress, lower our temptation to go into debt. If we do this, if we save up a little bit every check, but it also depends on having that discipline to buy only what you're planning to buy, you know, making sure you stay on track with what you're planning to do. So, you know, being smart, being thinking or being thoughtful about how you're using your cash, how about you're using your finances. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is the last uh, chapter that we're going to look at tonight. I think this is one of, this is the, the passage that always comes to my mind when I think of money. Uh, we're going to look at verses 6 to 10, and then we're going to jump down later on to verses 17 to 19. Now, really, this whole chapter deals with money, but we're going to look at just these two passages. We can be content with our finances if we're focusing on doing the right thing. Uh, Joyce has a comment. She says, if you express gratitude, so thanks be to God for what he's blessed us with, uh, for what you have, you'll find that you can be content. 
Again, understanding the source of the finances too is a very good point to bring up. God is the one who's blessing us with these things. He created everything that we see with our eyes, everything that we touch, everything that's around us. And we're only stewards of that for the time that we're on this earth. Uh, God is blessing us with what we have. And so we understand what he's brought, blessed us with, and we're grateful for it. We can be content with what he has blessed us with. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 10. Uh, if we make the focus of our life to serve God, we can battle that temptation to love money. Uh, we can battle that temptation to love money more than him, most of all. So 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 6. It says, But godliness and contentment is great gain. For we bought or for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So, very good passage to show us what we should have here, what we should have in our minds. Uh, it's that loss of priority and not understanding needs versus wants that really brings on that grief. You know, understanding what's really important in life. Again, uh, godliness co with contentment is great gain. Uh, if we have food and clothing, we can be content with that. Once those basic necessities are met, that's where we can start to be content. We're not, um, you know, physically not surviving you know, with what we're blessed with. We can be content with that. Uh, you know, we might start trusting the ads that we're bombarded with every day, thinking that we can get pleasure from spending our, all of our money at once for those fleeting things. Then when we have no money, we're constantly thinking about money. You know, it's something that's temporary. Uh, we can be more content when we understand our physical wealth is a temporary thing. It's not something that's going to last. Um, it's temporary in the sense, well, in two ways, really. Um, it's temporary in the sense that we can't take us with, with take it with us when we die. Uh, again, another thing my dad used to say is you never see U-Hauls behind hearses. You know, you can't take it with you. You know, again, we're just a steward while we're here on this earth. So it's temporary in that respect. It's also temporary on a more short-term basis. Uh, we get money and we spend money. Money comes, money goes. You know, that's one of the things, it's just a fact of life. Uh, if you can manage to save some of that money and spend it on something as an indulgence later on, that's being wise. It's not being foolish to just spend it all at once. You know, that's one way that it's temporary as well. Another way is that the things that we get with our money, the physical things that we might buy, you know, buy a brand new car, you buy a brand new bike if you're me, probably. You know, those things eventually deteriorate. Or maybe we just lose interest and we want a new one. You know, they go to the wayside. It's a temporary thing. These things pass. They kind of, you know, come and go. You know, that's the way the physical world works. Our relationships are much more important than that, especially our relationship with God. That's something that's going to last forever is that relationship with God. That's something that we can rely on, you know, 100% of the time for all of eternity. It's not going to be fleeting. That's one thing that we really have to focus on. And when we have our mind in the right place, as long as we have those basic needs met, we can be content. It's, it's something that we can manage and we can handle. So now we jump down to verses 17 to 19. The key here is to serve God. 2 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. It says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So I spoke about how the Bible instructs us to save a little bit more. And there's many other tips and tricks and instruction in the Bible. Uh, there's ways to yeah, avoid debt. It instructs us to avoid debt. The word that you might see is surety. It's another word for debt, you know, putting yourself in debt to another person. Uh, it even has verses in there to say diversify your investments. Make sure you diversify in what you're doing. So if one thing tanks, you're not 100% out of all of your investments. You know, these little things in the Bible, if we study it out, we can learn a lot about how to handle our finances. But the key here is to serve God. Do things for His glory. Make sure He is the priority in our life. When we do that, He's going to instruct us how to work our finances as well, so we can have that life on this earth that is truly life. And most of all, have that life that is truly life after this life passes away. 
Look for ways to serve others with your time and the things that God has blessed you with. Uh, again, he's blessed us, many people, with time. He's blessed people with talent. And he blesses some people with money. Some people are blessed. I like how in the first passage that we looked at, it dealt with um, being content with just food and clothing. So kind of on the low end of the wealth scale, you know, as far as the world we would consider it. And then he's looking here and talking here about somebody who is rich. And he's instructing them, don't become arrogant. You're no better than that guy that has less money than you. Uh, don't put your hope in wealth. Don't start saying, oh, I got all this cash. I'm safe and secure. You know, that was my feeling when I think about money. You know, put all your hope in wealth so you think that everything's doing just fine and you can ignore what God tells you to do. Don't do that either. Put your hope in God. Make sure that you understand that he is the one who should be the priority in life. And when you do that, then your money is going to fall into line and you're going to be able to serve God. You're going to be able to help others. He's going to bless you with that, and he's telling those people, or these people that are blessed with this financial wealth, this physical wealth, to use it in a proper way. Be generous. Be willing to share. Make sure you do good. Be rich in good deeds. Still act as a Christian should act, if you have money or if you don't have money. And part of that is being content and understand that God is never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And when we do these things, we are going to be laying up our treasures in heaven. We are to be content. And money should not be our master. Uh, God understands that, and he shows us how to deal with money in his scriptures. So we can study the Bible, and we can learn these things on how to deal with our finances. When we put him first, and the skills to handle the money will follow when we put him first and follow what he teaches us in scripture. And in this way, we're putting him as our master and not money. And we'll develop the skills to lead that content life. We'll understand that we put our hope in God and not in this physical thing, this money that, that we are uh, possibly relying on too much. Rely on God instead. Money is a temporary thing. It's going to pass in and out of your life, and it's going to pass fully from your life when you leave this earth. Uh, we have to remember, uh, money should not be our priority. Uh, we can learn how to use it properly. We can use, learn how to work with money and still serve God at the same time. Be generous. Use the things that you're blessed with to share, to serve God. Uh, again, as Joyce mentioned, express gratitude for what he's blessed you with, whatever it may be. And in that way, we're going to be using our finances, the things that we're blessed with on this earth, to serve God and to lay up that treasure in heaven. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to offer a prayer at the end of the study right now. Okay, let's bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time. I uh, pray that we can look to you, that we can always make sure that you're our master on this earth, that we make sure that we study uh, your holy scriptures, uh, that we understand that you have given us instruction on uh, how to serve you, how to accept your plan of salvation, and you've also given us instruction on how to deal with uh, the money that's in our lives, the physical wealth that we, uh, that we will experience, uh, that we can fall into a trap of, of putting it ahead of you. And I pray that you can give us the strength to trust you and to be content with what you've blessed us with. Make sure that we have our priorities in the right place. Pray that you can do that for us. Pray that you can give us the opportunity to uh, study the Bible, uh, to make sure that we can understand what you have taught us. And I pray that we can have the strength to put it into practice in our lives as well. And I thank you so much for blessing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be safe, be well, and God bless.